Welcome to Scripture Studies, a verse-by-verse study of the Bible. I'm your host, Scott Sperling. Today we're continuing our study of Romans chapter 3. We'll be looking at verses 19 through 26. So grab your Bibles, sit back, and open your hearts and minds as we study the Word of God together. verse 19 of Romans chapter 3, so you can turn there in your Bibles. As we discussed last week, in the first three chapters of Romans, Paul has been leading up to a grand statement of the gospel message, which he'll give us starting in Romans 3 verse 21. In order to lead up to that, he's been trying to convince us that everyone needs the salvation that comes through Christ. In chapter 1, Paul focused on convincing the Gentiles of this. In chapter 2, he focused on convincing the Jews of this. Here in chapter 3, up to this point, Paul has been answering some objections that his readers might have had about what he had said in chapters 1 and 2. So now here, in these first few verses of today's text, in order to lead up to the grand statement of the gospel, Paul summarizes what he has written up to this point. Let's read verses 19 and 20 of Romans chapter 3. Here's what Paul says, quote, Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin, unquote. So let's dig into it. Paul says in verse 19, quote, Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, unquote. In other words, whatever law that you have been given, whether it be the written law that the Jews had, as given to them through Moses on the mountain, or whether it be the law that is written on each of our hearts, which is the inherent sense of right and wrong that we all have as enforced by our consciences, Whichever of those laws that you have been given, that's what you will be held accountable to. Whatever the law says, it says to those who are under that law. Then Paul continues in verse 19, quote, So that every mouth will be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Uh, the words, every mouth will be silenced, says that everyone has a law that they are accountable to. And everyone has failed at observing that law. This is what Paul pointed out in chapters 1 and 2 of Romans. Both the Gentiles and the Jews are mired in their sin, disobeying the law as revealed to them. Then in verse 20, Paul tells us the consequences of this. Quote, Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law we become conscious of sin. The law doesn't have the power to declare anyone to be righteous. Rather, the law just proves to us that we fall short of the standards laid out in the law. Or as Paul puts it, through the law we become conscious of our sin. The purpose of the law is to make us conscious of our sin. It's to get us to turn to God in humility and to seek His forgiveness. The purpose of the law is to, in effect, convince us that we need to throw ourselves at the mercy of the court of God's justice and seek His grace. Because sinners that we are, we have not lived up to His perfect standard of righteousness. Note the universality of the condemnation. Here's what Paul writes in verse 20. Quote, Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Unquote. No one, not one person. This is a scary, damning sentence. No one will be declared righteous in God's sight. If Paul's epistle ended right here, our outlook would be extremely bleak. God's perfect righteousness and his perfect sense of justice demands an accounting for our sins, and absolutely no one is accepted or immune from this accounting. And also note that Paul is pointing out that it doesn't count for anything if we are considered righteous by other people. 
I mean, if in our community we're considered to be upstanding citizens or whatever, or if we're known as being fine people or whatever, none of that matters. What matters in the grand scheme of things is whether we're declared righteous in God's sight, as Paul says in verse 20. That's the only thing that matters with respect to our eternal destiny. And so, Paul has us where he needs us to be in order to accept the gospel. We have to be brought to a place of our utter hopelessness in order to appreciate and understand the greatness of the gospel. Here's how Charles Hodge put it. Uh, He was a great 19th century theologian and scholar, uh, the head of Princeton's Theological Seminary for over 25 years. Here's how he put it. Quote, To be prepared for the reception of the gospel, we must be convinced of sin, humbled under a sense of its turpitude, silenced under a conviction of its condemning power, and prostrated at the footstool of mercy, under a feeling that we cannot satisfy the demands of the law, that if ever saved, it must be by other merit and other power than our own." And that's where Paul has left us, here in Romans chapter 3, verse 20. And again, if the book of Romans ended there, we would have no hope. We would be stuck in a state of hopelessness. But it doesn't end there, just as the Bible didn't end in the book of Malachi. And thank God for that. There's more to God's revelation. And with the next two words in the book of Romans, everything changes. Paul says in verse 21, But now. With those two words, believe it or not, as I said, everything changes. The entire outlook for our futures change. Our entire eternal destiny changes with those two simple words, but now. Martin Lloyd-Jones, a minister of London's Westminster Chapel for over 25 years, said this about those two words, quote, There are no more wonderful words in the whole of Scripture than just these two words, but now, unquote. As I've mentioned, up to this point in the book of Romans, it's somewhat grim reading for the most part. Paul has been laying out his case that all people are sinful, that absolutely everyone falls short of God's righteous standard. And so, our deserved judgment has been placed right before our eyes. But with the words, but now, everything changes. A more pleasant outlook appears. After laying before us the bad news, Paul will now lay before us the good news, the greatness of the gospel message, the good news concerning Christ. Paul goes from speaking of the old era of sin's domination to the new era of salvation through Christ as expressed through the gospel message. With the gospel, the human predicament has been radically transformed. And so that's where we're at. In verses 21 through 26 here, Paul gives us his grand declaration of the gospel message. These verses, in effect, summarize the entire Christian faith. They summarize what we believe about the work of Christ. As I said last study, the importance of this passage in the book of Romans cannot be overstated. And I laid out what some prominent Christian scholars have said about these verses. Let's look at those quotes again just to remind us. Grant Osborne, an American New Testament scholar, called these verses, quote, the core of any discussion of the doctrine of salvation, unquote. Hermann Olshausen, a noted 19th century German scholar, called this passage, quote, the citadel of the Christian faith, unquote. Martin Luther said this passage is, quote, the chief point in the very central place of the epistle and of the whole Bible, unquote. Leon Morris, a renowned 20th century Australian New Testament scholar, went even further. He said, and listen to this, he said that this is, quote, possibly the most important single paragraph ever written, unquote. Very high praise the most important single paragraph ever written. 
And I can't argue with that. So let's read it. Let's read the most important single paragraph ever written, as Leon Morris calls it. It's Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 26. Here's what Paul says, quote, But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are all justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus." Good stuff. Now let's dig into it in detail. Paul begins his grand declaration of the gospel with a bit of a summary of it in the first one and a half verses or so. In these verses, Paul talks about the basics of the gospel. He really talks about the what, the when, and the how of the gospel in those first couple of verses. We'll look at each of these things as we look at verses 21 and 22. Let's read those verses. Quote, But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe." So as we look at these two verses, let's first look at the what of the gospel. The what of the gospel, or the heart of the gospel, can be summarized in the two phrases found in these verses. The righteousness of God is given through faith in Jesus Christ. That's what Paul points out here as he summarizes the gospel message. The righteousness of God is given to us by God through faith in Jesus Christ. You see, as we've said before in the first two and a half chapters, Paul exposed to us a problem that we all have. That problem is that in and of ourselves, as looked at from God's perfect standard of righteousness, Quote, there is no one righteous, not even one, as Paul wrote in uh, Romans 3, uh, verse 10. Here in verses 21 and 22, Paul introduces to us a solution to that problem. And that solution is that the righteousness of God is available to us through faith in Jesus Christ. That's the what of the gospel message. That's the heart of the gospel message. Paul also gives us the when of the gospel message. Well, he doesn't exactly give us the when here, but he does say that the law and the prophets testify to it. And so that's kind of the when. Paul is telling us that this is not something that he himself made up. This is not an invention of Paul's or of Peter's or of any of the apostles, nor is it something that Jesus stumbled on as he lived his life on earth. No, in fact, the gospel is a plan that Christ participated in devising within the councils of the Trinity from the foundation of the earth, from the beginning of time. Paul teaches us this in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Here's what he says, quote, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight." Unquote. Peter also teaches this in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. Quote, For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed out of the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake." Jesus himself said as much when speaking about the sheep and the goats in Matthew 25, verses 33 and 34. Here's what he said. Quote, he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, 
You who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world." Unquote. And so the gospel, the good news that we can attain righteousness through faith in Christ, has been God's plan throughout the ages. It's not a new thing. It's not something that the early Christians invented. And, in fact, in the Old Testament, as Paul pointed out, the law and the prophets testify to it. Let's look at some of those passages from the Old Testament. Isaiah prophesied it. Uh, here he's speaking the voice of God's people in Isaiah 61, verse 10. Quote, I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God. For he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of his righteousness as a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels." Unquote. Clothed with garments of salvation, arrayed in a robe of his righteousness, the church as a bride. All of these are gospel concepts, New Testament concepts, testified to here in the Old Testament. God himself described to Moses his own gracious nature and his desire to forgive sin back in the book of Exodus. Let's read Exodus chapter 34 verses 6 and 7. And the Lord passed in front of Moses proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin." Unquote. Our God is a God of grace, willing to forgive us for our sins. This is testified to not only in the New Testament, but also in the Old Testament. Isaiah wrote explicitly of Christ's sacrifice as providing the forgiveness for our sins in Isaiah 53, that great chapter with so many prophecies about the Messiah, about Christ. Here's what it says in Isaiah 53, verse 11, quote, After he has suffered, speaking of the Messiah there, after he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities." Unquote. Justify many and bear their iniquities. That's the essence of the gospel testified to right here in the Old Testament, just as Paul had told us. If you want to read more about this, the entire book of Hebrews can be seen as a commentary on the many ways that, as Paul says, the law and the prophets testify to the gospel message. So that's the when of the gospel. Now let's get to the how of the gospel. And what I mean by that is how we can gain this righteousness from God. And we touched on it before, but let's look at it in detail. The how can be summarized with this. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ. Faith in Jesus Christ, that's how we obtain the righteousness of God. Again, Paul says in verse 22, quote, This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ. Unquote. And so what does that mean? What does faith in Jesus Christ mean? Faith in what? Now, by the way, Paul talks about this more later in this passage here in Romans, but we'll get a bit of a head start on it here. To understand this faith, we need to contemplate the law of God as given to Moses and how, in the law, God established that forgiveness for sin could be obtained through a substitutionary sacrifice, through a blood sacrifice made on our behalf. The slaying of a lamb or a goat or bull was established in the law as being sufficient to provide atonement for sins. Now, these laws whereby a person could be forgiven by the shedding of the blood of the sacrifice, these laws point ahead to Christ's sacrifice. The purpose of these laws was to foreshadow the blood sacrifice that Christ would make on our behalf. Through Christ's sacrifice, we could obtain forgiveness for our sins. And so through Christ, God provided the perfect substitutionary sacrifice because Christ's sacrifice was sufficient to atone for all the sins ever committed. The reason that Christ's sacrifice was able to have such a wide-ranging, forgiving power is that Christ was perfectly righteous. 
Christ had no sin, and so his sacrifice was sufficient to forgive the sins of everyone. John teaches us this in 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. He says, quote, Christ is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world, unquote. And so, in order for us to have our sins forgiven, in order for us to obtain the righteousness of God, we need to have faith to believe that, indeed, Christ died for our sins. We need to have the faith to believe Christ's sacrifice was the atoning sacrifice for our sins. That's what Paul is saying here back in Romans. That's the faith that Paul is talking about here in Romans, when he says, quote, through faith in Christ. That is, through faith that Jesus indeed is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Through that faith, then we attain the righteousness of God, a righteousness sufficient to keep us from the punishment due for our sins. This is the righteousness of God that Paul speaks of in verse 21. This is the necessary righteousness that we need in order to be reconciled to God. God is perfectly righteous, and so we can't be reconciled to him unless our sins are atoned for. We couldn't dwell in his presence in heaven unless our sins are forgiven. And so this problem that we all have, which is that we're due to be condemned and punished for our behavior here on earth, this problem can be solved if we would, by faith, enter into this righteousness that God has made available to us by accepting the sacrifice that Jesus made on our behalf. Jesus and the work of salvation that he did for us is necessarily the object of the faith that brings this righteousness, the faith that brings this salvation. A general faith in God and in his sovereignty is not enough. Many people, in fact, most people, have a vague faith in God, a faith in a creator. This is not what is talked about here. Paul says specifically, faith in Jesus Christ. What Paul means by this is that a person needs to believe that he or she needs the salvation offered through Christ. They need to come to a place where they acknowledge before God that they have not lived up to his righteous standard, or in other words, that they are sinners. And then they must realize that Christ's sacrifice is the only way to become reconciled to God. This is the necessary faith in Jesus Christ that Paul is writing about here. This is the saving faith. Now, this faith and the righteousness that comes through it are available to anyone and everyone. It doesn't require a great intellect or being born in the right family. It doesn't even require a pious upbringing. It merely requires humility. Humility before God. A humility that says to God, I'm not worthy. I've fallen short. I haven't lived up to your righteous standard. It's a faith that is not limited to one chosen group of people, or a class of people, or race of people, or nationality. It's not even limited to those who do good works from time to time, or to those who think they're good. On the contrary, it's really limited to those who realize that their good works are not enough. People who realize that their good works are really beside the point. Or as Paul puts it in verse 21, this righteousness is apart from the law. This faith is not even limited to those who belong to a specific religion or denomination or sect. One does not have to be a churchgoer or a member of a Christian church to receive this gift of righteousness, this gift of salvation. It's available to all people equally who were created by God. Jew, Gentile, rich, poor, bound, free, learned, uneducated, powerful, meek. And this is Paul's point in the next few verses from the end of verse 22 through 24. Here's what Paul says, quote, There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus, unquote. All have sinned, and so all are offered justification, and all are justified in the same way, by God's grace through faith in Christ. We're introduced here to the word justified. Let's talk about 
justification, about what it means to be justified. I'll turn to the scholars for their definitions of justification. Douglas Moo, a contemporary American scholar and expert in the Book of Romans, he wrote that justification means, quote, to be acquitted by God from all charges that could be brought against a person because of his or her sins." Unquote. Johann Peter Long, a renowned German scholar, wrote that this justification is, quote, a judicial act of God by which he freely acquits the penitent sinner and adopts him as his child on the ground of Christ's perfect righteousness and on condition of a living faith. Unquote. The meaning of justification, or what it means to be justified, can be easily remembered with a somewhat silly sounding mnemonic, uh, but it's reasonably accurate. To be justified means to be treated by God just as if I'd never sinned. Again, to be justified is just as if I'd never sinned. So justification is more than just a pardon. In fact, it's much different than a pardon. If you rob a bank and then are sentenced to 20 years in prison, then after a few years the president pardons you or something, then you're free to leave prison, but you're still a bank robber. You're still guilty of your crime. You just got lucky that you knew the president or whatever, and he made it so you don't have to serve out your sentence. Justification is different in that it actually confers righteousness so that in God's eyes, it's like you never sinned. You're effectively clothed with the righteousness of Christ through faith in Christ, so that God views you as having Christ's righteousness. That's why Paul says in verse 22, this righteousness is given. Again, verse 22, this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe, unquote. The righteousness is given. The righteousness is conferred upon you. You're not just pardoned. You're righteous again, just as if you'd never sinned. This point is important because if you're just pardoned, then you're still guilty. And so you couldn't have fellowship with our infinitely righteous God. But if you're justified, then you're clothed in Christ's righteousness. You no longer stand naked before God. God sees you as he sees Christ because you're clothed in his righteousness. And so you enter into the glory that Christ deserves. You enter into the inheritance that the Son of God deserves because you're clothed with Christ's righteousness. There's a wonderful picture and really a foreshadowing of this in the Old Testament, in the oddest of places. It's an episode that took place in the lives of Jacob and Esau, the sons of Isaac and Rebekah. When I read this episode as a kid, I remember thinking, this is the goofiest story I've ever read. All these people are absolutely crazy. And they are, the story is crazy. Until you look at how it pertains to us as Christians, let's look at that episode. It's in Genesis chapter 27. We won't read through the whole thing. I'll summarize the episode for you. Jacob and Esau were twins, and their father Isaac was close to death. Isaac decided to bestow his inheritance blessing on Esau, who was the eldest son. This blessing that Isaac was bestowing is akin in that culture to the reading of the last will and testament uh, for us. And because Esau was the oldest of the twins, he would inherit the family farm, so to speak. Now, Jacob, Esau's brother, was his mother's uh, favorite son. So she wanted Jacob to receive the blessing. Also, Jacob had convinced uh, Esau years before to give Jacob the birthright. That episode is in Genesis 25. And so Rebecca and Jacob both believed that Jacob deserved the blessing from Isaac. But apparently Isaac didn't know about Esau giving up his birthright. And so as far as Isaac was concerned, Esau deserved the inheritance and deserved the blessing that he was about to give. So Isaac called Esau in, and here's what he said. It's found in Genesis 27 verses 2 through 4. Isaac said, quote, I am now an old man and don't know the day of my death. 
Now then, get your equipment, your quiver and bow, and go out to the open country to hunt some wild game for me. Prepare me the kind of tasty food I like, and bring it to me to eat, so that I may give you my blessing before I die." Unquote. And so Esau went. Esau was an outdoorsman, while Isaac was a bit of a homebody. Um, Esau was brawny and hairy and smelled like the outdoors, while Jacob wasn't so hairy and, I guess, didn't smell like the outdoors. In any case, when Rebekah heard that Isaac was about to confer the blessing on Esau, here's what she said to Jacob. Uh, it's found in Genesis 27, verses 8 through 10. Uh, quote, now, my son, listen carefully and do what I tell you. Go out to the flock and bring me two choice young goats so I can prepare some tasty food for your father, just the way he likes it. Then take it to your father to eat so that he may give you his blessing before he dies." Unquote. So her plan was to send Jacob into Isaac's room so that Jacob would get the blessing instead of Esau. Now, isn't that crazy? It's insane. So Jacob killed one of their goats, and Rebekah prepared the stew, while Esau was still out hunting. Then this is what Rebekah did. Uh, it's in Genesis 27, verses 15 through 17, quote, Then Rebekah took the best clothes of Esau, her older son, which she had in the house, and put them on her younger son, Jacob. She also covered his hands and the smooth part of his neck with goat skins. Then she handed to her son Jacob the tasty food and the bread she had made." Unquote. So Rebekah gave Jacob Esau's clothing to wear so that he would smell like Esau. Isaac at the time was effectively blind. And then Rebekah put on Jacob's hands and neck the hairy goat skins to simulate the hairy arms of Esau. I mean, Esau must really have been hairy. And so Jacob goes into Isaac's room with a stew, pretending he's Esau. And here's what Isaac says. You can find this in Genesis 27, uh, verse 20. Quote, Isaac asked his son, how did you find it so quickly, my son? Uh, Jacob replied, the Lord your God gave me success. Unquote. That's when I'd be like ducking, you know, waiting for lightning to strike or something, the Lord your God gave me success. I mean, what a what a lie that was. And Isaac catches a whiff of Esau's clothing and thinks, ah, that's the smell of my son Esau. And then Isaac touches Jacob's hands and, and thinks, yeah, that's my hairy son Esau. And so he gives Jacob the blessing. It's a crazy story, as I said, and I thought so even as a, you know, like 10-year-old when I first read it in a Bible story book. I thought, what's with these crazy people? Who would do such a thing? Until much later, when it was pointed out to me that we Christians will do pretty much the exact same thing. On Judgment Day, we will stand before God looking to receive an inheritance that we don't deserve. But because we'll be clothed in the righteousness of Christ, just like Jacob was clothed in the firstborn Esau's attire, because we'll be clothed in the righteousness of Christ, we'll receive an inheritance that we've done nothing to deserve. God the Father will look at us and he'll see Christ. And because of that, we'll be able to enter into the kingdom of God. Of course, the analogy isn't perfect, because unlike Isaac, God is not blind to all this. Uh, God well knows that it is us sinners who are clothed in Christ's righteousness. But in his grace, he'll allow us to enter into glory anyway. Not based on anything that we've done, but because we have faith in what Christ has done for us. Praise be to our God of grace. The Bible is really great. The whole thing, the Old and New Testament, is all about Christ and the work of Christ and anticipation about the work of Christ. And so even this crazy episode in the history of Jacob and Esau points, in a way, to the work of Christ. Amazing, amazing book, the Bible is.
We hope you enjoyed today's study. If you're interested in other studies in this series, visit scripturestudies.com. That's scripturestudies, all one word, dot com. Or Google Scripture Studies by Scott Sperling, and you're sure to find the site. The background music is licensed through Pond 5. The theme music and interludes are by Scott Sperling, all rights reserved. Until we meet again, live well, serve the Lord with passion, and always lean on the Holy Spirit. May the Lord be with you in all of your endeavors. Amen. Amen.